many of you prayed? How many of you prayed? How many of you prayed? That someone would go back and unmute my mic. <laughs> and we bought a new battery, I forgot to unmute it. <laughs> <laughs> I have discovered that, that oftentimes, evenings that kind of go like this, something will happen. When you leave here tonight, you won't remember the pastor's battery going dead or whatever. All you'll remember is that God showed up. And in your heart and your mind, that's all that matters. So that's my prayer tonight, that regardless of some of the technical difficulties we have, that you'll leave here tonight feeling as though God showed up and all is well. So today, we're talking about how to grow deep and finish strong. And believe it or not, it's not quite as easy as it sounds. In fact, it requires, for you football fans, you'll appreciate this term, it requires a game plan. Okay? And here it is. There's three phases to this game plan. I reserve a daily time with God for Bible reading, self-examination and prayer, in order to, dramatic pause, because this is the reason we're doing all of this, okay? In order to know God, that's the first thing, and His will for my life, that's the second thing, and to gain the power to follow His will, there's the third thing. So the commitment in total is this. Reserve a daily time with God for Bible reading, self-examination, and prayer in order to know God and His will for my life and to gain the power to follow His will. Sounds like a lot. We'll break it down. Suffice it to say that spiritual growth is a choice. Spiritual growth is intentional. So the question we need to answer honestly tonight is this. Are you going to be more spiritually mature in 2013 than you were in 2012? When January 6, 2014 rolls around, will you be different than you were January 6? Did I say that wrong? January 6, 2014 rolls around. Will you be more... Deep spiritually than you were January 6, 2013. And if you're even remotely tempted to go, well, I don't know, maybe, possibly, kind of, no, you won't be. Because again, spiritual growth is a choice. It is intentional. You have to make a conscious choice in your heart and in your mind to say, I am not going to be the same person next year that I was last year. I'm not going to make the same mistakes this year that I made last year. I am going to be a better me this year than I was then. I'm going to let go of some of those painful choices and mistakes that I've made in my past. I'm going to let go of some of those sins that seem to keep creeping up in my life. I'm going to let go of some of those personal messes that I seem to keep making. And I'm going to be a better me through the power of the Holy Spirit in this new year, maybe than I've ever been before in, in my entire life. But again, that doesn't happen by accident. It requires a conscious choice followed by continuous effort. Let me say that again. It requires a conscious choice followed by continuous effort. In other words, you have to move beyond good intentions to great living. Many of the verses that we're going to look at today have a, a word that you'll find in, all, in most all of them. It's the word continue. Because again, it's all about continuous spiritual growth. Spiritual growth is a continuous, ongoing, lifelong process. We never reach that point in our life where we can just step back, take our Bible, put it on the top shelf and say, that's it. I did it. I made it. Woo! 
I am the repository of all things spiritual. I have attained maximum spiritual enlightenment. There's nothing more for me to learn. There's nothing more for me to grow deeper in. There's nothing more for me to develop. I've grown all I can grow. I can't grow no more. Stick a spork in me, I'm done. We never reach that point. We never reach the point of omniscience, right? So that means if you're not growing deeper, you're dying. The Bible says this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Listen to the very first word. It will not surprise you. Continue. Continue to grow. Continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about how to mo maintain that momentum that we started at the starting line with. How do we keep on keeping on? How do we maintain that starting block momentum? How do I complete the course, finish the race, and get that gold medal? The Bible says that there are seven things that we need to do to continue in the faith. Seven things. And we're going to spend about 20 minutes on each and every one of those tonight. Oh, no, we aren't. No, we aren't. <laughs> do you know why it's a series of sermons now? Okay? Sermon series. Or there would be a series of people no longer returning to the well. So we can't cover all in one night. So let me please encourage you, come back next week and hear a little bit more. But the first thing uh, we need, and this is, our, our, this is where we're going to camp for the rest of the night, we need to fix a daily time with God. Fix a daily time with God. Fix it. That means that you nail it down. You drive a stake in your ground. And you say, this is going to be my time with Jesus on a daily basis. And if anybody's looking for me between this time and this time, they know where they're going to find me. They know they darn well better not disturb me. Because this is sacred time. Time specifically reserved for me and my Heavenly Father to grow closer together. Time specifically reserved for for me to grow deeper in my walk with Him. And throughout Scripture, we're taught that you have to be connected with God in order to have power in your life. You have to be connected with God to have the power of God. Makes sense, right? If grapes are disconnected from the vine, they don't grow so well. And Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. You cannot bear fruit apart from me. You cannot bear fruit in your life if you're not connected with the vine that is Jesus Christ. It's like having a nice, new, shiny coffee maker in your house, right? And you're so excited, and you put the water in, and you got just your favorite kind of coffee, and you're getting ready to do it, and nothing happens. Why? Because you're disconnected. From the power source. So you can do everything else right. Have all the greatest supplies. But if you don't plug in to the power source, you get nothing. So let's be honest. You're going, yeah, that's fairly obvious, Pastor. No big epiphany there. I didn't see any of you going, wow, that's so great. Let me write that down. Woo! <laughs> Praise God. It's common sense when it comes to electronic devices, right? But let's bring it a little more personal. What about when it comes to our relationships? If you don't spend time with the people that you care about in your life, you're going to get disconnected. Shanna and I discovered this a long time ago. When we're gone or she's gone and we don't spend a lot of quality time together, we start feeling very distant, very disconnected. We don't feel close. We don't feel that intimacy. So if your marriage or your relationships are starting to feel a bit dried up, or you don't have that sense of, of love that you used to feel, it's because you're not spending enough quality time together. Do you remember what it felt like when you first fell in love? 
just being near the person did something to your whole body, right? Your palms would get sweaty. And if you even happened to accidentally just brush up against them, it was like, oh, 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 oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? I don't know. <laughs> oh, that was yesterday. <laughs> and when you're not together, you kind of feel like that old Elton John song, right? Time on my hands could be time spent with you. I guess that's why they call it the blues. <laughs> you wanted to spend every waking moment that you could with that other person. You hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. And we need to get back there when it comes to our walk with Christ. You know, one of the things that, that God said He had against some of His people in Scripture, He says, you forgot. You forgot your first love. Have you forgot your first love? They say you never forget your first love. But I would tag that with saying, unless it was God. Because for some reason, it's so easy to let the physical and what you can see and what you can touch supersede what you can't see, even though it's of eternally greater significance and import. Don't forget your first love. Don't forget what it felt like that first time that you told God you loved Him. Don't forget about that first time when you felt like You've really, it really clicked, not just in your head, but in your heart and your whole being, that God loves me. He really loves me. It's not just a story they told us in, in Sunday school. He really loves me. And how that made you feel and how that impacted you and, and how you wanted to share that with other people. But again, if you don't spend time with the people you love, you get disconnected. If you don't spend time with God, you get disconnected. You have to spend time with God in order to be close to God. You have to spend time and experience His love and His, His passion and His presence. The Bible puts it this way. Now, dear children, continue to live. Notice there's the word continue again. Continue to live in fellowship with Christ. Now, dear children, continue to live. Continue, continue, continue to live in fellowship with Christ. I, I just want to let my guard down for a minute and confess to you, just between you and me, don't tell anybody else. Camera. <laughs> that even though I'm a pastor... And even though I've been walking with God for over 35 years, even for me, the hardest part of my spiritual journey is guarding and protecting that daily time alone with God. Because the enemy fights against Him. Everything fights against Him, against it. Do you know why? Because Satan knows if he can keep you disconnected from the source of your power, then you're defenseless. And you have no strength to fight against his temptations and against his lies and against his deceits. And guess what? He really doesn't care what else you do. You can do all kinds of amazing things with your time as long as you don't spend time with God. Why? Because that is the number one purpose in life. Contrary to popular opinion and Stephen Covey and Ken Blanchard and all those time management gurus, you are not put on this planet to check things off of your to-do list or yes, Spouses, forgive me, the honeydew list. God created you so you could grow in your knowledge and understanding of Him and love Him and embrace Him and walk with Him so that He could too know you and love you. So if you're not spending time knowing and loving God, you're missing the number one purpose for your life. 
And Satan doesn't give a rip about all the other good things that you can do as long as you don't spend time with God. That's the number one connection you need to maintain is between you and God. As important as that connection is between you and your spouse or you and your parents or you and your children, the number one connection in your life has got to be between you and God. And if you ever find that your love for your spouse has exceeded your love for God, you need to spend some time in prayer. Your love for your spouse should be And I know that's hard to comprehend and maybe we're going to go home tonight spending some time processing that, but God has to be first and your spouse second. My email address is jeffrey.heron at inumc.org if you have questions. Let me ask you this. What do you think the enemy's primary game plan or game the plan of attack against you keeping you uh, disconnected from God would be. The enemy's game plan is actually quite simple. He just wants to keep you busy. But again, you could be busy doing a hundred, two hundred, a thousand different things, but the bottom line is if you're too busy for God, you're too busy. Because you're putting everything else in front of the number one commandment. Do you remember the number one commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Unless your spouse is in the room. <laughs> no. No. Love the Lord your God with most of your heart. Does this give you maybe, I hope this does give you maybe a better perspective, a better understanding of why Satan fights so hard to derail you on your path towards time alone with God. Because he knows, he knows that it's that time with God that gives you the power that you need. And your life without that power is like a microphone without a battery. It doesn't do you any good whatsoever. The Bible says this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Everyone who lives in union with Christ. Now here comes a word that we've been talking about tonight, but it's in a bit of a, bit of a different perspective. Everyone who lives in union with Christ does not continue to sin. Hmm. Say, okay. All right, well, what exactly does that mean? It means that when I'm really connected with Christ, He gives me the power. He gives me the ability. He gives me the desire. To not do all those things that I would kind of like to do, but no, I shouldn't. Isn't it Paul that said, I don't understand myself. All the things I don't want to do, I do. And all the things I want to do, I don't do. What's wrong with me? The reason why we keep falling into those persistent sins and personal weaknesses and personal failures and stumbling blocks is because we don't spend enough quality time alone with God. I call it T-A-W-G, TAWG time. Time alone with God. Now, just in case you haven't picked up on it already, this is in fact a one-point message. Andy Stanley would be so proud. One point. The essential nature of spending time alone with God. And if you don't get this one point, if you somehow miss the importance of this spiritual building block, then you might as well not come back for the rest of the series. 
Because none of the other things that we're going to talk about in this series of sermons is going to matter one tiny little bit if you do not have this basic fundamental building block of spending time alone with God every single day. Now, because I can't spend 60 minutes on each one, because I, there's so much to this one topic that we just don't have enough time to cover. I have prepared for you, and they are available in the back on our new Welcome Center, uh, a printout about how to have a better quality, uh, quiet time with God. It's actually written by a guy you may have heard of. His name's Rick Warren. And it's titled, How to Have a Meaningful Time with God. And this booklet will explain to you how to have a regular, meaningful time alone with God every day. You've got to fix it, or you can forget it. You've got to fix your time alone with God, or you can forget growing deep with Him. Okay? Have I hit that horse enough? <laughs> I want to leave you with a challenge tonight. Here's your challenge. I am going to ask you during the course of this series for 100% effort. 100% effort during this Grow Deep at the Well series. I really want you to commit to growing deeper in your faith, in your walk with God, in your spiritual development. Prioritize. Prioritize attendance at being here every Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Do what you have to do to get here ready and prepared to hear the Word of God proclaimed. Don't do like my dad used to do. My, when we were growing up, my dad was the, was the last person to get to church and the first person to leave. <laughs> If you're even remotely like me, and I know most of you are going, I hope not, but if you're even remotely like me, spiritually speaking, when it's time to worship, I need to get there just a few minutes early and just still my heart and close my eyes and just kind of let everything else go away for a while and, and prepare my heart and mind for that sacred thing we call worship. Otherwise, what happens is I rush in halfway into the first song. And by the time I have found that place of worship, I've missed half of it. Does that make any sense? So again, I want to ask you for 100% effort. And just in case, just in case there's one or two of you out there that are tempted to say, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 80%, brother. <laughs> I mean, after all, there are football games on, you know. And I still got some Christmas decorations I need to take down, and I may want to visit a few relatives, or I need to go hunting, or maybe, maybe, maybe others of you, are, you're hearing that, and you're going, no, 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 no. I'm going to do better than 80%. In fact, you know what? I will give 99.9%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If that's you... If you're one, part of the 99.9% .9 crowd, I want to ask you to consider the consequences of what we will call almost, but not quite. Okay? According to research, if 99.9% .9 were considered good enough, then this year alone, 2 million documents would be lost by the IRS. 12 babies would give them, be given to the wrong parent each day. 291 pacemaker surgeries would be done wrong. 20,000 incorrect prescriptions would be written. And that's, that's not saying if 80% were good enough. If 90% were good That's if 99.9% .9 were good enough. All of that would be happening. And as great as that is, do you see anything on this list that has eternal significance? 
As dramatic as that is, is there anything there that is so dramatic that it goes beyond the grave and into all of eternity? But that's the kind of consequences we're talking about when it comes to your walk with Christ and growing deeper with Him. Now, we're running out of time, so instead of applying this negatively to the practical side of life, I'd much rather compare it positively to the spiritual part of life. And we have to go back to a word that we've tried to forget over the last few years. And if you were here this morning, you may be thinking I'm leaning towards a word that Larry used, because this is a big word we need to talk about another time, and that's commitment. But there's another word that I want to remind you about, and it's the word justification. Justification is the sovereign act of God whereby He declares righteous the believing sinner. Now how does this connect to what we're talking about? How righteous does God declare? 99.9%? 100% righteous. So stop and think about it. Upon believing in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the once lost sinner is instantly, unconditionally, permanently declared 100% righteous. Anything less, and we're not righteous, we're almost righteous. And if we're declared 99.9% .9 righteous, some of the verses that we have in Scripture, we need to rewrite those. The one that first comes to mind is Isaiah 1, verse 18. See if this sounds right to you. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be light pink. <laughs> Makes no sense whatsoever, right? The promise of sins forgiven is all or nothing. So let's never forget that God is into white as snow, not light pink. If Christ had paid 99.9% .9 of your sin debt or, debt or my sin debt, we still would not have a chance of getting into heaven. So Jesus gave 100% so that we could be 100% redeemed, forgiven. With that in mind, how could we even possibly consider offering back to Him anything less than 100%? So do you want to grow deep? You want to go kind of deep? You want to go a little deeper? My prayer for all of us, I mean, this... And again, I, I feel led to remind you that this isn't something that is just for lay people. People that were pastors and priests for all of their life and have since retired, and, and they still are continuing to grow deep in their walk with Christ. It's a lifelong process for all of us. But remember... Our power to keep on keeping on comes from Jesus Christ. So I pray you'll come back next week. We'll learn a little bit more about what it means to grow deep and finish strong. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to you tonight and we recognize that um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are those in this room who are, who are such dynamic, powerful, respected Christians that are already striving with their lives to grow deeper with you every day. And so I thank you for those here tonight that that are a shining example of all that we should aspire to. 
I pray that you would help us all to hear your voice, to hear your leading in those areas of our lives, that you would have us draw closer to you. And may it begin with a concrete determination to spend time daily with you. Amen. We love you, Father, and we thank you for this time of worship. And we now continue to sing your praises. In Christ's name, amen.